Chapter 13, Section 11, Biography, Women of the American Revolution. Think of the American Revolution. Who comes to your mind? Most people would likely think of founding fathers like Benjamin Franklin or John Adams. There is no doubt that these great men helped pave the way for the American Revolution. However, women played a role too. Together with the Sons of Liberty, the Daughters of Liberty gave full support for the Revolution. They held spinning bees and made Liberty Tea to support the boycott of British goods. They wrote letters and even went to the battlefield. After the American Revolution, leaders thought that it was important that future generations were prepared to take part in the new government. Women were considered to hold the key role of raising their children to be active citizens. An interest in how women should be educated in the new republic increased. During this time, several all-girls academies were established to teach young women history, geography, and composition. One of the best known schools was the Young Ladies Academy of Philadelphia, which was founded in 1787 with the support of Benjamin Rush. Though the thought behind this Republican motherhood was for the sons of the women, it was also granted women new access to education and opportunities to learn. Here is a look at some of the great women of the American Revolution. Abigail Adams, 1744 through 1818. Over 200 years ago, there was a girl who dared to be different. Few girls went to school at that time, but Abigail Smith wanted an education. Luckily, her father had a huge library. She used these books to teach herself. When Abigail was old enough to marry, she chose a man who also valued books and learning. His name was John Adams. She became Abigail Smith Adams. In those days, there was no United States. Instead, there were 13 colonies. A colony is a place that is ruled by another country. The 13 colonies were ruled by a king. He was far away in the country of England. This would soon change. John Adams would help start a new country, and Abigail would give him important advice and support. Both John and Abigail Adams were patriots. Patriots wanted a country where people chose their own leaders and made their own laws. The Patriots knew that to break away from the king would mean war. A group of men met secretly in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They met to form a new country. John Adams was there, but Abigail Adams stayed home. Back then, women did not make decisions about government. But Abigail read the newspapers and formed her own ideas about how the country about her own ideas about the country to be. She wrote letters to her husband. The letters were filled with her ideas. Remember the ladies she wrote. Abigail Adams wrote about rights for African Americans too. At that time, millions of African Americans were enslaved. Enslaved people have their freedom taken away. Their rules, their lives are ruled by others who treat them like property. Abigail Adams believed this was wrong. African Americans have as good a right to freedom as we have, she wrote to John Adams. Abigail's letters helped her husband think about certain issues in new ways. Martha Washington, 1731 through 1802. It was the nicest gift the ragged soldiers could have wished for. It was February 1778 and Martha Washington had come to join her husband at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania right before his birthday. The army of the American colonies was camped there for the winter. Martha's husband, General George Washington, was their leader in the fight against Great Britain. The fight, known as the American Revolution, would last for eight years. There were about 11,000 soldiers at Valley Forge that winter. Their living conditions were terrible. There weren't enough supplies to properly feed and clothe the army. Many soldiers had no shoes. Their clothes were in rags. They had few blankets and not enough food. Martha Washington came prepared to help. There were other wives who had also joined their husbands. Martha mended clothes, knitted socks, and cooked meals for the men. She encouraged the other wives to do the same. She helped nurse the sick. She arranged parties to lift the spirits of the weary soldiers. She even put on a play to entertain the men. 
Martha Washington had not come from a life of such hardship. She had been raised on a wealthy Virginia plantation. At 18, when she married Daniel Park Custis, she lived on a vast 17,000-acre plantation. When Martha was only 26, Custis died and she became one of the wealthiest widows in Virginia. Two years later, she married another Virginian, a famous young officer named George Washington. The Washingtons lived a busy and comfortable life at their plantation home, Mount Vernon. In the 1770s, however, conflict with Great Britain turned into combat. Some of Martha's friends and family remained loyal to Britain. Others, like her husband, went to war. In 1775, George Washington became the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. For the next eight years, he was away from home. As she did at Valley Forge, Martha joined him to do whatever was needed. After the colonies had won their independence, George and Martha Washington would leave their beloved Mount Vernon once again, George to become the first president of the United States, and Martha to become the first first lady of the United States. Phyllis Wheatley, about 1753 to 1784. At about the age of seven, the child lost everything. She was kidnapped, snatched away from her home, family, and country. She was taken on a ship called the Phyllis. The ship took her to Boston and some 4,000 miles from her African home. The year was 1761. As the ship docked, a couple arrived in Boston to buy a slave to use as a servant. They bought the young girl, and the girl became Phyllis Wheatley. The child was small and weak, and she had a lot to learn, but she seemed to learn English quickly. The Wheatleys could see that Phyllis was very smart, and so the family started teaching her to read. She learned to read English by the age of nine, and then she learned Greek and Latin. She read books like the Bible, and then she began to write. Because she was so well-educated, some people thought that she was a genius. Others thought that she was a fraud. Most slaves were not given the chance to learn to read and write, and no one could quite believe that an African slave child could learn these things. The smartest men in Boston questioned Phyllis about her truthfulness. They were, they were amazed. She is no fraud, they declared. What did Phyllis Wheatley do with her genius? By the age of 12, she was writing poems and letters. She was the third woman and the first African-American woman in this country to publish a book of poems. However, Boston publishers did not print her book. While on a trip to London, England with the family, Phyllis found a publisher there. The book made her famous. She proved to everyone that she was a poet and she did more than that. At that time, Boston was part of a colony ruled by Great Britain. American colonists called Patriots wanted freedom from the British king. One day, just a few blocks from where she lived, there was a riot against the king. Shots were fired. The fight was called the Boston Massacre. The American Revolution had begun. Phyllis Wheatley used her genius for the patriot cause. She wrote patriotic poems. She wrote strong letters of support to people such as George Washington. The patriots went on to win their independence. But Phyllis Wheatley had already won something for herself. Before the revolution had ever begun, she had won her freedom from slavery.